Well, hello, everyone, and welcome again to another edition of the Travel Royally podcast today. We're very excited to have as our guest, Mr. Simon Greatrex, who is the general manager of the venerable English Golf Club, St. Enadoc. Simon has a long history in club management and the hospitality business, and he's in a beautiful part of England. He's a very keen golfer himself, and his younger man played off a three handicap. So he's clearly better than I am. But St. Anadoc is one of the finest golf courses in England that you'll ever see. And today we're excited to learn more about Simon and about the golf course. Simon, welcome to the Travel Royally podcast. Good, good morning, Jeff. And uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to um, to come on and talk about St. Anadoc today. And I got your last name correct. You did. Absolutely spot on. Yeah. Not many yeah, people yeah. say that first go. Although I just blew it by telling everyone that I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> um, so for those of you that don't know where St. Enadoc is, it's down in Cornwall, on the Cornwall coast. It's a beautiful part of England. And I've heard it most often compared, Simon, to um, the uh, main area, New England, kind of a, a place for where people go on holiday. Would you agree with that? Okay, yeah, well, uh, the county of Cornwall is um, is probably number one in the UK for holiday destinations. Certainly, um, you know, the right on the right on the southwest edge of the country, surrounded by the uh, English Channel and the Atlantic, and obviously lots of beaches, lots of beautiful places to come and visit, and obviously some great golf courses as well. Absolutely. Now, you're not from there originally, though. You grew up in Yeovil, didn't you? I grew up in Yeovil in Somerset, uh, uh, known as Cider County, uh, where they make, uh, you know, uh, falling over water called um, cider made from apples. And uh, that, that very fond memories of um, living in Somerset. Um, can't remember all of it, obviously, if I've had some cider, but, uh, but a great county, very friendly people, yeah. Now, uh, are you a supporter of Yeovil Town? They are my second team. Uh, I, I spent most of my formative years living in Hythe, which is very close to Southampton near the, near the Solent. Um, so I've got to say that, that the Saints, who even though they're really, really struggling at the bottom of the Premier League this year, um, I have to say I'm I'm them first and Yeovil second. The Glovers, Yeovil the Glovers. Yeah. yeah. Are, you a big, are you following the World Cup at the moment? I was up to uh, last Saturday, Saturday night. Uh, um, inevitably, uh, ironically, inevitably or not, ironically, both at once, uh, we we succumbed to the dreaded penalty shootout or penalty miss again. Uh, I don't know how if we're if we're ever going to overcome that, but it was a good game to watch. But obviously, uh, really sad to see us go out. I thought we had half a chance this time around. Well, my uh, friends call me the cooler because whoever I'm rooting for, I have this, I cool them off and they lose, right? So <laughs> I, Harry Kane stepped, I go, Harry Kane never misses. And then there was, there, was a, there was a video running around on social media at the minute. And I don't know how long ago he did it, but he did a, uh, like an advertisement with a British comedian and Johnny Wilkinson, who, um, is a very famous rugby player who won the World Cup with a last minute, uh, basically a field goal. Um, and they're in a video with Har him showing Harry Kane how to kick it over the crossbar. Um, and that is just flooded on social media. And I feel I do feel sorry for him because I think, you know, if, if it was any of us in that position with all that pressure of the 25 million people watching you on the telly, then uh, then we probably wouldn't have even better kicked the ball. Well, yeah, yeah, it, it, and he's a wonderful player. It's uh, we're all big fans. Um, my family is big into soccer or football, and um, yeah, we all support. We all love the uh, the Premier League over there. It's starting to take off in the US. I think it's a much bigger sport than it. Than it used and you know to what? Be. Yeah, you know it's different over here from where you are. My understanding is, like, if you want to watch all the games, you have to pay for them. Over yeah. here, NBC bought the rights to all of them. So you can watch all of them. Wow. Yeah. Right? So you could literally, like, Boxing Day, mm. 
we'll just be – you can sit there all day because the games will start at 7 a.m. our time. And and I think they may even have a 2 p.m. game. So you can literally – and depending if and, and and NBC owns multiple channels, so you could you could have multiple ch- multiple streaming games on. Um, it is expensive. I don't know if you have you heard of Sky uh, in the states. Is that a presence in terms of no? So uh, I think they they own Fox or something like that uh, in the in the US maybe. Um, yeah. But it's about six thousand pounds a year here to have the license to have Sky and watch any sort of football at all, which is a huge amount of money, really. Right. Um, I know I know my, some of my members on a Saturday afternoon wouldn't like me to hear, them, hear me say this, but it's one of the expenses I could do without, really, in terms of um, how much it gets watched and uh, what value for money it gives. But very expensive. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're, we're done with uh, that. Now let's move on for the reason we're here, which is golf. Sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How did you come to golf in the first place? Um, I I took it up around about the age of eleven, uh, where I lived in you know close to Southampton. Um, my dad used to play, you know, occasionally. I wouldn't say he was a you know a handicapped golf or a member anywhere, but he used to take some friends over to the municipal course in Southampton, which um, you know it, it's still there actually. Uh, there's not very few of those in this country now. Uh, that still survive that are run you know by town councils or you know um basically public golf courses yeah um, and there's still lots of them in the in the us but um uh so i used to play there casually i was left i'm left-handed so way back when i was 11 years old what 40 years ago um very hard to get hold of any equipment golf clubs anything at all so when i was having lessons i can remember my first pro telling me uh, are you sure you want to play left-handed? Um, and because I used, if I was going to play snooker or tennis, I would use my left arm for that. Yeah. Remember, we used to do lessons uh, in in the the grass range it was bordered by a couple of farmers' fields. Um, he used to put me over a barbed wire fence while the other kids, the right-handed kids, were all learning, and made me swing with my right arm in the long grass. Um, until my right arm became dominant. So that's like my junior lessons from 11 years old for about two years was taking hand springs to school with me to every chance I got to strengthen this arm up. Wow. Um, and, and basically this, this arm is now the dominant one and my left arm, I still would use that, but I don't really play much racket sports and stuff now, but. He made me do that. He said, otherwise you'll never be able to play golf left-handed. So um, so then I I really got the bug once I could start having some conventional lessons and yeah. uh, never looked back from there, really. Excellent. That's fair. It's, uh, I think a lot of people come to golf the same way that you did. You know, their dad or their mom take them out to play and their, their parents uh, may or may not be keen golfers themselves, but want to expose the children to the game and I know that's what happened with me. Now you're the you're the general manager at St. Anna Doc, and that's a term that's relatively unfamiliar here in the states. Um, and I know over there people use the term club secretary as well. So um, tell us about the that you know the role of general manager in a club. So the um, the general manager's role basically is to to oversee everything. A, a club club secretary sometimes uh, could be the role of just organising fixtures, events. Uh, you know, looking after people's handicaps. Um, more the sort of uh, on course responsibilities and things that a club would have. General manager looks after to everything. So you know, all the governance, all the HR, all the marketing, all of the um, help, uh, every element of, you know, you know, pretty much what a CEO would do at a business. Right. Uh, but obviously, uh, it's, the, it's, it's the members golf club. So there are committees. So I have a management committee and a, a captain's committee and a greens committee. Um, and you obviously have regular communication with them and they they basically, you know, work with you, uh, strategizing where the golf club's going and how you're going to look after it and what you're going to be doing to improve it. Yeah. So, in short, 
pretty much everything a general manager will be responsible for. Yeah, that's very different from from here. And, and you have a club captain as well, I would assume. We do, yeah, yeah, and a chairman of the of the club as well, yeah, yeah. Um, and then you have co- subcommittees under him or under that group, like greens committees or. So we have a greens committee, yeah. Uh, we have a ladies committee. We have a, a, a senior section. Um, so it, it does sound a bit like all I'm probably doing is spending my time sitting in committee meetings and writing the minutes and things up. There obviously is a lot of that. Um, but there is quite a bit of autonomy as well in terms of, um, you know, your responsibility to, to purchase things for the club, uh, all its supplies, uh, and obviously liaison with the greenkeeper and, and you know, lots of work on the golf course about understanding the agronomy and uh, the different seasons of the golf course, what you need to apply to it. When you when you um you know certain times of the year when you're going to do all your maintenance etc yeah well I know prior to coming to Saint Anadoc you were at uh, at Yovo Golf Club what how did you how did you move to what led to the move to Saint Anadoc um well, I, I must admit I was really happy I, I, you know by a real quirk of fate um I ended up uh, as general manager at Yovo. Um, obviously, back to the, my birthplace. Really, uh, from my from my office there, I could see the uh, maternity unit that I was born in. Every day. Yeah. And so that was really quite strange to start with. It was quite a fateful thing, I think. Um, but uh, we've been there about six years, and um, really loved my time there. Some great people there. Two two lovely golf courses right on the border of Somerset and Dorset. Uh, around about eight hundred members. Uh, but we always used to come on holiday to Cornwall whenever we got the chance and in this particular part of the world. So we would stay Port Isaac, which is a lovely port uh, a fishing village just uh, north of here um, very regularly. And um, whenever we came, I used to smuggle my clubs in the in the boot of the car, hoping that um, I'd earn enough brownie points to to come out for a morning's golf whenever I could escape to do that. And every time I came, I'd made sure I put my clubs in the car because I, I, the first time I played the golf course, I remember it being on a on a really nice, calm, still, sunny day. And literally, you know, the whole experience of walking over the, the top on the first hole with a pitch right. behind you there, every, every vista you have after walking over the first dune to play your second shot to the first green, is just absolutely stunning and um you sit you know not that you, you're not doing a fabulous job at yeovil and it's a great place to be but you you go home thinking wow what would it be like to uh to be involved in a golf course like that and um really really a dream come true i can't um you know every job has its good and bad days but you've only got to wander out for a few holes after work and how quickly do they disappear and dissolve yeah. Just looking around. Doesn't matter what standard of golf you're playing. Um, it's a very special place. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm obviously, or I shouldn't say obviously, as we talked before we came on, I, I said I haven't played there. It's it's literally number one on my list. And I I I, I can't wait to get there. So um now St. Anadoc is an unusual name. Where does the name come from? Um, so it comes from the, the the church. There is a church on the tenth hole that gives the course its name. Um, and originally, when the course was first founded, way back in the eighteen nineties, um, that's where the original golf course was, or activity of golf was played in and around the Damer Bay and the and the church area. So the basically the the, the church is the the lead into the the golf course is named. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, Simon, the thing that stands out for me from what you've talked about is um, how beautiful the course is. You you use the word stunning to describe the views once you get over that first d- dune on the first hole. I've heard nothing but great things about the course and about that area of the world um, and the club itself as well. Now, in the U.S. somehow, St. Anaduck is largely unheard of. And for those that are listening, I just want you to know it's ranked number one in Cornwall, number 10 in England, 
number 29 in Great Britain and Ireland, and number 74 in the world. So, Simon, how was St. Enodox such a well-kept secret over here? I, I really don't know. Um, I, I think we, we were having a talk, um, you know, be, before we, um, we we do this today, and um, you know, the the big ticket, big draws, I guess, uh, in the US are pockets of all those those you know St Andrews and Carnoustie and all the open courses and all the really high standout links courses in Scotland and Ireland. Um, that are above us in those charts, and and rightly so. Um, and it's more of a destination, I guess, of a, a tried and tested um, destination with the history of the sport. You know, obviously, lots of it having its origins in Scotland. Um, I think that's a big draw for a lot of the golfers in in the US in terms of the serious people that 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 want to travel the world and play, you know, stand out, stunning golf courses with lots of pedigree and stuff like that. I think. The, the only issue we have here is um, St. Enadoc, we are squeezed into some of that lovely coastline. There isn't really, as golf's progressed and the sport's progressed, um, it, it seems you need ever and ever more space to get longer and, and keep up with all the technology and the yardages you need to consider yourself to be a, a venue for some of the events that give these clubs their pedigree. Um, right. So we don't have a long history of having opens or you know high profile amateur events that we could market ourselves in that way um what we do have is a par 69 golf course um against you know most of those courses in scotland would be 71s or 72s and a little bit longer um but by no means um any less difficult uh, there's always a breeze here because the links courses up high there's not many links courses you'll play anywhere in the uk or scotland that um hide you away from the sea behind dunes and things or there's a bit of a gap between the golf course and the sea um there's always a breeze here the terrain of the golf course um is very very challenging it's uh you know likened to playing on the moon uh, in some places on the golf course especially the start holes one two three, four, five, and six, um, I challenge anybody to uh, find even an open venue that is as difficult. Um, all the members will say, you know, if you play in a stable foot and you have 12 points up six holes just playing to your handicap, you've done phenomenally well. Yeah. Um, you try and you're always trying to catch up. Uh, there aren't really any, any holes on the church course where you could say, well, do you know what? I had a bad hole on the last hole. Um, I've got half a chance of, you know, getting something back on the next one. It is yeah. every every hole is a a real stop and think about what you're doing and and how you're going to approach that shot. Yeah, that's you've got my mouth watering literally to uh, come over and play, and um, I'll be happy if I get through those first twelve holes or six holes in a stable third with zero. If I just go through unscathed, I think I'd be happy. Um, well, you've got a lot to be proud of there at St. Anadoc, but when we talk a little about the course, I want to talk more about it in a moment, but tell us about the club itself, um, the members, the clubhouse, the facilities, and so forth. Yeah, so we've got we've also got two golf courses here. So uh, the church, um, although you're – you're perhaps not quite so familiar with it in the in the US there, Jeff, but it is very well known in in this country. Um, but we have another 18-hole course called the Hollywell course, and there there is a bit like the church is named after the church on the 10th hole in the church. There is a holy well um, on the uh, 12th hole on the on the holy well course. Um, and there's there's quite a lot of history uh, in and around that. I think people used to get baptised, you know, centuries ago uh, at, at that spot. Um, and that was designed in about 1928 um, by the original owners. So the, there was a chap called Theophilus Hoskin who bought the land um, and then ended up uh, in one of the properties um, by the Tent T. Uh, and when he died, um, his widow insisted that 
no golf was to be played on a Sunday uh, it, out of respect of her husband um, being buried in the church graveyard. Um, so the the owner, the then owners, then had to design another golf course just to play on Sundays um, to obviously uh, comply with the wishes of of um, Mrs. Hoskin. So uh, nine holes was designed by James Braid. So nine holes of the Holy Holywell course is a James Braid design, and then later on in the eighties, um, another nine holes were added by purchase of some land. Um, nine par fours, nine par threes. Uh, one of them being uh, described by Henry Cotton um, as the hardest par three on the whole property. I heard, um, I read that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but by no means a uh, a poor relation in terms of the golfing experience. It's it's almost like a a Lynx course in miniature, really. Uh, right. Green greens are a little bit smaller. Longest hole is about four hundred yards, but some real challenging um, tests. Uh, in that kind of same style as the church course would be. Now, is the church course, is it now open on Sundays or is it still closed out of respect? No, so that, that disappeared long ago. Uh, I guess when Mrs. Hoskin passed away, uh, that was all bets off then, I guess. But um, but then obviously since then, um, you know, changes to the course, a uh, few team positions that have you know made it to its maximum length of about 6,600 yards now. Um, so par 69, 6,600 yards off the really back tees. Um, really challenging to anybody that comes, really. Um, we have about 2,000 members here currently. Um, about 1,400 of those uh, do not live locally, so they don't live in Cornwall. Um, so around about 600 local residents. Um, Does that mean that your weekends are pretty full then? With Because uh, I'm assuming that when... People come down from Birmingham or London or other parts of the country that they tea times are quite dear. I would assume. I think I think we're really lucky. With, um, the uh, the country and holiday house members that we have um, don't visit for months at a time. They're only here for you know the peak times of the year, April to October. So during you know in between those times um, during the winter, the courses are very quiet. Which obviously is good, good in a way because obviously we can plan maintenance. We can, um, you know, look after the golf course and help it recover from, you know, a busy season. Um, I would say we probably have around about thirty thousand rounds of golf over both courses on a on an average year, if, if that makes sense. So, how many of uh, those rounds are visitor rounds? About fifteen percent of those. Yeah. 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 Excellent. So, yeah. That's um. Do you have overseas members? We do have a number of those. Um, probably around about twenty or thirty, maybe, uh, in total. Um, often that tends to be somebody who was a uh, a resident member or a you know uh, a UK member, and has then moved away but wanted to retain their their membership in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Um, but um. We yeah we don't have a, a huge amount of those but um, it, it's a good mix it's um you know it, it's obviously the club's been here a long time uh, and the committees and members that are um, uh, are responsible for planning everything have a good handle on uh, you know the balances that we need to keep against yeah. the use of the golf courses so it's it's tried and tested and it, it works fairly well. Uh, we have a good practice facility, so we've got a good short game area uh, with um, you know lots of opportunities to hit all sorts of short game, pot bunker practice. Got an eleven bay driving range, it's about three hundred yards long. Um, so uh, yes, you know I would say fairly high standard of uh, facilities that we have here, and that you would expect um, you know a course of our stature to have. Yeah. Again, my mouth is watering. You talked about the first six holes and how it, it could feel like you're playing on the moon and that they're very difficult. Yes. Um, talk about the rest of the course and what makes the church course so special in your mind? Um, again, I think it's a, a very unique golf course because it's up high. Um, so there are so many vistas and 
uh, so many weather conditions that you'd experience uh, against, you know, perhaps a flatter, longer links course. Um, there's all sorts of flora and fauna. We're right, uh, we're right next to the bay. We're right next to Dama Bay and Rock Beach, um, and in between there's a what we would uh, we call a triple SI in in the UK. I don't uh, don't know what the designation would be in the US, but Basically, it means there are lots of rare plants, lots of rare uh, bird species and animals, lizards, um, certain types of spider, pyramid orchids, and things like that. Um, we also we would call some... that a future oil refinery. <laughs> Simply, <laughs> <laughs> that's a um, I can't possibly comment about that, but uh, I'm sure there are lots of areas in the U.S. that are, are coveted, right. in terms yeah, of, protect, uh, environmentally protected, that you can't touch. So. Um, it's been pretty pretty much that way uh, since the golf course was built, um, and obviously it's something that we're we're very keen to try and preserve. And our stewardship of the golf courses goes hand in hand with um, you know trying to promote the diversity and obviously all the all the tr- troubles that we have going forwards in terms of um, realizing what we're doing to the planet and. Uh, and trying to reverse that and yeah. and, uh, and work with nature rather than against it, basically. That's easy. But the yeah. other the other the other holes on the golf course, you know, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, coming right along the the closest point um, to the sea and the estuary, absolutely outstanding. Um, Tom, Tom Doak describes it as, uh, you know, one of the most three challenging holes that you'd ever have to finish a golf course. Um, especially prevailing wind would be. In your face, so 550 yard par five over the over the rolling dunes by the beach, and then a 210 yard par three over a valley up to an raised green in, tucked inside another dune, and then the 18th, a 440 yard par four with a clubhouse staring in the face um, into the breeze. Very very difficult. Yeah, you're you're making me very sad. <laughs> Sad's not the right word. Wistful for the opportunity to come and play, I suppose. Uh, now, in in the, your area, there are lots of wonderful courses. What other courses in the area would you recommend? So, if you are coming or thinking of coming for, um, you know, to play multiple rounds, i.e., a tour, um, just the other side of the estuary, so um, about half an hour's drive from where we are, uh, is Travose. Um, so, another Lynx course, uh, again, very highly rated. A um, uh, bit more of a, um, a sort of setup there to host big parties, big events. Has 110 bedrooms, I think. Um, uh, more of a sort of a resort feel to the clubhouse. Uh, mm-hmm. Certainly, St Enidoc is, uh, and that is a bit longer. So that is getting towards your 7,000 yards. Uh, again, right by the sea. So Constantine Bay, uh, which is about four bays along from here. Um, Perrin Porth, which is probably just over an hour's drive from here, I would say, um, is another James Braid uh, design golf course. Um, and that is, uh, out of the three, I would say, um, just as challenging in terms of there are, the, the terrain is is like St. Enidoc on steroids. Um, and there are a lot more uh, blind tee shots, which kind of divides golfers sometimes, I think, um, especially right. if you're not used to Lynx golf. Um, you know, mentally, if, you, if you're if you hitting a tee shot over a mound or aiming at a marker post, you not really know what's on the other side. Sometimes that puts the fear of God in people, doesn't it? So that divides people's experience in terms of um, whether they thought it was it was good fun or not. But very, very challenging, pair and poor. Um, and that looks out right over Perrinport Bay as well. Very, very picturesque golf course. Now, if you drive across um, over into Devon, there's some wonderful courses over there as well, right, that you would consider great links courses. Devon, you have Burnham and Barrow. Um, you have, uh, uh, which is obviously very highly rated as well, um, the championship course there. They do host uh uh, big amateur events. Um, they have an RNA event there uh, in 2023. Um, again, very challenging links course. Pretty much straight nine holes going in one direction and then 
straight nine holes coming back, so quite a narrow strip of um, property. Uh, you have Royal North Devon, which is the oldest club in England. Uh, Westwood old, Ho. That's Westwood Ho, yeah. Um, very, 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 very quirky golf course. Um, you have to experience that to, um, you know, experience the history of it, I guess. Um, there are some really unusual features. There are, I wouldn't know, like ball rushes, I guess you would describe them as, um, on lots of holes that look like you have literally no room to hit the ball or you've lost it in a in a ball rush. Yeah. Um, very, very enjoyable round of golf on fairly flat terrain, so a bit of a floodplain, uh, but looking out across to Saunton, which is another... Great, uh, two great 18 hole courses there, east and west. Yeah. Um, again, very challenging, quite long, um, similar to terrain to St. Enidoc. Um, we, we have, they are basically called the Atlantic Lynx courses. So Saunton, Royal North Devon, Burnham Barrow, and us, and Travos. Those five clubs, if you wanted a, a great tour, you know, that's tried and tested in this country. Lots of people do that. Um, well, see, so you just uh, are you sure you're not a tour operator? You just designed the perfect tour, right? You <laughs> described why people should flock to that part of the world to play golf. You've got, well, I think that you know, the, the setup half that, a dozen great courses. Yeah, the, the setup for that um, between the five golf courses is a tried and tested, um, you know, itinerary, if you like, uh, for lots of tours that we we've hosted over the years. Certainly, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if we, I shouldn't say if, when we send groups to uh, St. Anaduck, what can they expect um, at St. Anaduck? Um, you know, from the perspective of the members, the clubhouse, the welcome, and so on. Uh, well, you, you'll always, always get a warm welcome. We, uh, I must admit, I, um, I, I, I guess I was quite brave the other day, but we had a um, member survey. So a survey just amongst our members. And um, very often they would be your fiercest critics. Um, normally when visitors come, because, you know, the, the, the experience I kind of illustrated when I first played the club, not knowing anybody, and I was a visitor myself, can't help but be, be blown away with the the geography and the terrain and the how good the golf course is. Um, it almost goes halfway to um, you know you're having a fantastic experience in any case. But all of the members of the golf club ranked the hospitality and the welcome and the friendliness of everybody the most highly, um, wow. which which I thought was you know um, obviously the pessimist in me would say. Everybody who doesn't like uh, the golf course for whatever reason would jump on and and give you bad marks. But um, you know, right up to very recently, so October, we're talking a couple of months ago. That's when the survey was done, and um, we we couldn't be more happier with the response we got from our own members. So that perhaps goes some way to show to show that if you're a visitor, then you know we would treat you equally, um, you know, to the experience that you're going to have. Yeah. That's um, that's exactly what we want to hear, right? We want we want our guests to have an amazing experience, um, an unforgettable experience. We do surveys at the end of every trip as well, and it's a two part survey where the top half is about um, it would say something like rate your experience at St. Enidot, right? Um, Tell us, rate your experience, and it goes from zero to five, five being best. Um, and so typically there are about 15 questions there about the experience of the properties and the cars and the everything that we that we signed you up for. And then at the bottom would be questions about us, right? Like, how was our knowledge of English golf? Uh, did we communicate? Did we listen? Did we, all those types of things, right? And um, that allows us to do a better job of fine tuning the experience. So as an example, someone uh, came back from Scotland and rated their um, the property we had them at as a three out of five. And they listed all these reasons why. Well, that will never put someone at that property again. 
Yeah. Right? We're not going to, we're not going to risk someone having a poor experience because of, you, you can't ignore those comments. Right. So anyway, that, I'm, uh, I'm glad that you did that. Now, you know, I know that you, you love St. Anadoc and you love Yeovil in terms of golf courses. What other, what would you say is your favorite course in England other than those two? Do you have one? Um, I, I, um, I've played a lot of golf, obviously, in 40 years. Um, I wouldn't say I've, um, I've been, uh, you know, continental with that. I would say most of my golf has been played in this country. Um, I did a few years ago have the opportunity. We played in a, uh, like a, a national event where if you won the round at your golf club, you then went to play a semi final in Scotland, which ended up being a course in near Dundee. Um, so I couldn't. I couldn't have not had that opportunity without trying to go and play St Andrews. Um, and I'm sure, you know, everybody that's listening uh, in today, uh, many of them would have had that as top of their list to at least go and try and play. And it is quite a, it's quite a complicated thing to try and get a game. So as we were playing in the semi-final uh, to try and get to the grand final, yeah. they had to tell phone to try and get into the ballot for them to phone you back by four o'clock to tell you when we got tea time the next day. And um, luckily, we got a nine o'clock tea time the next day uh, and raced over to St Andrews to try and get some accommodation. And as it happened, um, it was the the worst possible day we could have picked because it was parents uh, showing uh, students around for the university weekend. Um, so we ended up staying right behind the uh, the old course clubhouse um, with uh just a fantastic experience actually walked to the golf course with our spikes on down yeah. the road to get to the tee um and couldn't have played it on a nicer day cool crisp october day no wind absolutely loved it um so i think that's a mecca of golf i actually birdied the last hole you know you spend wow. that time to it on the telly and such an unusual place you know people are wandering up the road with golf clubs in their hand and you never see that anywhere else right um, and then i always remember there's a guy walking his jack russell dog with a newspaper on his arm and i hit my chip shot shot in a little bit thin and it just caught the valley of sin and checked up to about that and i got a and that that, that just made me feel you know that's a real special memory for me in terms of uh I, you know i probably won't get the chance to do that again not while I'm playing any sort of decent golf, that's for sure. So um, there's number one. I would say number two, uh, especially in Scotland still, we went, my dad took me on a holiday once and we went the other coast. So um, Presswick, True, that side, uh, West Coast, we played a course called Southern S, which is literally in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it looks over the Solway Firth back towards Carlisle and the UK, no, sorry, England. Um, and that was just right up there in terms of um, you, 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 you're talking today about nobody knows about some of these golf courses and they really should, but it was phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. I'm going to uh, ruin that and tell you I've played there. Yeah. I feel the same way. And the other one that's up that way or down that way from Scotland is right over the border, Silicon Solway. Have you, have you played yeah. there? I haven't, no, but lots of our members have. And um, the the advice we get, we have a course advisor. His, his name is Chris Haspel, and he is very well traveled in terms of, um, you know, the, the expert advice we get to look after golf courses. And he uses that as one of his examples of, um, you know, a small golf club, but, you know, overachieving in so many ways it's a standout fantastic yeah course. yeah, yeah. yeah I can't wait southern, to get a chance. southerness is really special and you're right it is in the middle of nowhere i mean we um i'm trying to remember i mean we i played silith on solway and southerness um back to back over a two-day period i don't remember we must have stayed somewhere near southerness but um 
we love finding those off the beaten path courses like you just described where you don't run into a busload of Americans. The last thing I want to hear on a trip over there are American accents. I want to go to the courses that you describe in Cornwall and Devon, where I'm not running into busloads of. You, you want to go somewhere where you can't understand what people are saying to you. <laughs> if I want to do that, I'll go to Northern Scotland. I, you know, you need three pints to understand what they're saying, uh, I think. So what else is on your list? I'm sorry to interrupt. No, 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 that's fine. Um, I would say, uh, especially a bit closer to where we are at the minute, um, we, we've we left out St. Melian, uh, which is on the border of Cornwall and Devon near Plymouth. Um, that, the, the Nicholas course um, off the White Tees, which you're perfectly allowed to play as a visitor, um, is definitely the hardest golf course I've ever played. Um, cool. It is it is brutal, absolutely brutal. Yeah, um, can't describe to you. We we went. I remember going on a holiday once, and we had a tour. So the 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 tour rules were that whatever handicap you had at the start of the first round, stable for every day, um, and if you beat your if you beat your handicap, obviously your handicap got cut to to whatever it should have been. However many shots you missed your handicap by, you that was your handicap for the next day. So by the time we got to Somalian, it was towards the end of the week. My handicap at the time was six, I think. But And I'd not had a very good week's golf, it has to be said. But by the time I got to Somalian, I was off 14. And I scored something like 27 points when I should have had 36 playing off of 14. And, and I didn't play that badly. Um I I think as a challenge, you know, in the summer, if if you were if you were looking to have a real punishing day's golf, but obviously a very nice, well kept golf course, unbelievable design, um, that should be on your list. It's not too far away from here. It's probably as far as Perrin Porth is that way. Um, yeah. You know, the Melian's back the other way. Um, so I'd highly recommend that if you were if you were coming for that type of experience um sunningdale uh, up near london yeah. i would say uh standout has to be the best kept golf course i've ever played on um 36 holes there 36 green keepers you're serious i'm absolutely serious yeah when we played um we played about two or three holes this is a few years ago now but I went up there with a, a friend of mine who's a professional um, and the the whole experience, you know, there's a, a caddy master where you sign in, there's all sorts of people. Sam Torrance was on the steps, ready to go over to the practice range to hit a few balls, said hi to him. Uh, started our round and, and just thought, oh my God, you know, this is like playing on a carpet and hit a short iron into a, into a green, and there was a greenkeeper wheeling a hand mower behind us on a couple of wheels. We said good morning to, took a divot, and we're like, oh my God, that divot's quite a chunky one. And he said, don't put that back. And I was like, well, I can't not put that back. And he said, you see that tractor behind you? And we were like, yeah. He said, that guy's filling all the divots in as you're playing around. I was like, you are joking. And he said, 36 holes, 36 green keepers. Every week, someone swaps around. So they just look after one hole and they do every single technical bit to that hole. Um, and then they swap around. Uh, 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 incredible. Absolutely incredible. Well, that 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 makes me want to switch gears here now because you. I know that I want to ask you where, you know, what's the one place you want to play in the world or what courses would you most like to play? And I know that you're going to say Augusta National. And you haven't been there for the Masters, have you? No, no. Okay, I haven't been to Sunningdale, and I, I can imagine based on how you described it, an amazing experience, right? I, I, I can't imagine. Um, and the one course that I want to play that's inland over there is the Belfry, because I've seen so <laughs> many tournaments there and Ryder Cups, and I don't know what hole it is. It might be the tenth, if I'm not mistaken. Or I'm probably wrong. It's like a drivable par four over water. 
10. Yeah. yeah. That's, I, I, you know, I just. Go have a go at that. Yeah. But Augusta National, I will tell you, is a similar, in similar nick to Sunningdale, right? I mean, there's not a blade of grass out of place. Yes. Right. Yeah. I mean, literally not a blade of grass. And you're thinking, how in the, you know, how do they do this? Because it's, it's literally perfect. Yeah. It's like Sunningdale. It's just, yeah. So, okay. So what other courses are on your bucket list to play that you most want to play? Um, we have a lot of members uh, here that are members at, um, uh, Swinley Forest, uh, very close to um, Sunningdale. We have a what they call their sort of heathland belt there. Right. Um, lots of courses with heath and sand and pine, you know, pine trees and that kind of um, geography. Um, uh, Wentworth uh, would be a bucket list one for me. The 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 west course at Wentworth, obviously, having seen that so many times on the telly over here, our right you know, where our, our PGA is held every year. Obviously, been many years when I lived in Southampton, not too far to travel up there to go and watch uh, and see all the all the people that you would have idolised as you were growing up playing golf um, and thinking crumbs. You know, what would it be like to play to play that golf course again? You know, right in that sort of uh, stockbrokery belt of London, um, where all the golf courses are are phenomenally well looked after. Right. Um. Where else would I like to play? I think I would, uh, looking at, obviously, my last club, top 100 and things weren't even on the radar. Um, but obviously, it is on my on my consciousness now, only because St. Enadox included in it. But um, Cape Kidnappers or Tariti in New Zealand. Uh, Australia is the furthest I've ever been. Obviously, New Zealand's a, a hop onwards from there. Um, but there are some fantastic golf courses that are springing up there. Yeah, uh, Cabot, Cabot Cliffs, um, again, you know, rank, rank. That looks a very interesting golf course. Don't know if you've you, you played that one yet, Jeff. But I I, every there week, are so many. Yeah, well, every for me, everything's just trying to get back to where you are. Literally, I, I don't go on golf vacations over here because every dime I have goes to going back to play Lynx golf over there. Now, I, you know, I lived in the Pacific Northwest. I played at Bandon Dunes, which is spectacular. Um, and when I go over there, I typically don't play inland courses because I can play those here. I can't play St. Anadoc over here, right? It's so. I think but, that that's what makes um, Lynx golf such a draw. Um, I think it's because, well, you'd be able to tell me because I haven't played any courses in the States, but um, it, it appears to me that there there are lots of clubs, you know, the core amount of clubs in, in America um, would be sort of set up in a certain way. So you would, you know, it, it would be targets to greens. It wouldn't be, it would be short irons into greens. It would be pitching wedges and expecting the ball to stop and, and grab and all the rest of it. Lynx golf is almost a different sport. It, it's right. a bit like, um, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit like trying to play hockey around the green sometimes. You know, you, if you attempt to try and hit a short iron downwind in into like the second green, uh, if you, if you if you're lucky enough to it be downwind on the second, you would have no chance at all holding the green, especially in the, the spring and the summer months. Yeah. So it's a complete new type of skill and shot repertoire that you'd need to learn or experience when you come to the UK and play on a league's golf course. Yeah, I think, um, you know, in the US, we have 16,000 golf courses. That's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. 1,600 of those are in Florida, just to tell you, think about that. I mean, that's... Yeah, that's one uh, in every every town, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, and I live in Georgia, south of Atlanta. Um, it's it's considered Metro Atlanta where I live, but um, we have a set up here, and uh, in my little town, which has thirty five thousand residents, we have five golf courses. Wow! And you join one, you belong to all of them. So when we play on the weekend, we rotate around those five golf courses. So we never would play the same course twice. 
Now they're not in the same kind of nick that Sunningdale or Augusta National uh, are in, but um, uh, they're very nice layouts, and it's a very affordable membership to have over here. But so let's uh, let's move on. We're uh, I don't want to I want to be respectful of your time. I've got a couple of questions left. So if you were going to set up a dream foursome of people living or dead, who would you play with, and where would you play? Um, I, I think, um, I think I'd have to pick a golfer out of those four. Um, and I've got to say, before I started work at St. Enidoc, um, and that this isn't, this is no lie. Um, Tom Watson was, um, someone who was an idol of mine. I think the way he conducted himself and, uh, the way he swung the golf club, um, can't think of anybody who comes close to that uh, currently. Um, just an, an awesome, awesome goal for any human being. Um, yeah. And strangely, uh, my predecessor, uh, Buck Claggett, um, he, he he was American, uh, or is an American, sorry, and um, he went to school with Tom Watson. Uh, and he's caddied for Tom Watson um, at the Masters, and he caddied for him when he was in the playoff with Stuart Sink at Turnbury. Um, and he's visited, he's not visited in my time, but he was a regular visitor to St. Anadoc when he was coming over to play either in the Open or the Seniors Open. Or um, So I really hope that I could get to meet him one day, uh, perhaps with a bit of Tuck's help. Um, but he would definitely be one of them. Uh, yeah. I, you know, in his prime, or I'm sure he, had, he still has a very good stand in the golf to yeah. this day, even in his 70s. Um, the second person I think I would choose would be, uh, you, you won't probably know him, but he's a physicist called Duncan Cox. Um, and he has lots of programs here in England uh, where he explains the universe in kind of a way that you would almost have a thread of understanding of what he's talking about. Uh, and some of the things he says blow your mind. You know, like, uh, for instance, would be, um, we don't really think about it very often, or lots of people don't, but perhaps it's just my personality, but he's saying in one of his programs, every single living organism has an, a carbon of atom in it that was there when the Big Bang happened. Uh, and all of those things like that make you think about your own, uh, you know, why you're here and right. you know, your existence, basically, uh, and trying to fathom, you know, the, the the monumental space and time and distance and everything else that goes with it. So I think for four hours around a golf course with him would be uh, a real education. Absolutely. Um just to kind of mix that up a bit, I've, I, I've gone for a uh, a UK comedian. You will know him in the, in the US, I think, Ricky Gervais. Um, uh, not everybody's cup of tea when it comes to uh, his brand of humour, but uh, I think very, very intelligent, very creative, um, very observant uh, of uh, human humankind, basically, yeah. and the behaviours we all have. So... I'm not sure golf's his thing. Um, so, you know, you asked me uh, for, for a hypothetical and uh, I think the last thing he'd probably want to do is play golf maybe, but um, he could caddy, couldn't he? He could, he could be a caddy. Yeah, he's a wonderful guy. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not sure, is that four? That's four. Is that well, four? you, Tom Watson. Well, obviously, and myself as well, obviously. Yeah. Just, just so I could observe everybody's um, comments and how good they were at golf. Yeah. And now they've got one at St. Anadoc, up and down all the hills. That would be a very interesting foursome you've got there. Wait, so what's left on your golf bucket list? Is there anything big on your golf bucket list? In in terms of playing or? Um... Just in general. I mean, I know what courses you want to play, but are there things that you want to experience? Maybe it's a hole-in-one or? Well, I've, had, I've, had, uh, I've had three or four of those. I'm not, not bragging, but. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Remember Mark in someone's handicap car once at my first club I played at in Hive, um, uh, at a hole in one on a par four. <laughs> but 
But the, the rule of the day was that you, you had to buy everybody a drink if you had a hole in one when you went back into the clubhouse. But I was only, I think I was probably 18 or 19, not long started work. And it put the fear of God in me because before I'd finished, everybody says, well, you better get your wallet open. Um, but I go off on a technicality because I was only marking someone's handicap score. It, it didn't count, apparently. So I got away with that one. But that was a real memorable shot. It was 300 and... 20 yard par four downhill, see, could see the green, uh, but I couldn't see the ball go in the hole because it was too far away. Um, but got down there and somebody was jumping about uh, saying it's gone in the hole. Um, that's probably the most memorable one. But bucket list, I, I guess, um, just just to, uh, you know, probably quite corny, but just to stay here and uh, stay in Cornwall, I absolutely love it. I, 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 what a lifestyle to have. Uh, to live and work somewhere like this is a is a real um, dream come true. Like I said earlier, um, I'm sure lots of people um, are coveting uh, this role, and you know would be the same as I have once they've played the golf course. And if they're involved in golf, then um, why wouldn't you want to try your hardest to come and um, come and have a go at uh, you know running the place and and seeing thousands of people come along and join themselves it's um it's a real fortunate thing to to be done so i am very fortunate i've, I've crossed a massive one off my bucket list so all the other ones are fairly small i would say well i think uh yeah you're right i mean i you know i, I never thought if someone asked me that question what would my response be but I, I, i'd probably say something very close to what you said i think i've you know, I've achieved everything I want to in golf. I've played, you know, the courses I've wanted to play. My my wish, my bucket list would be able to continue to come every year like I have for 25 years and continue to enjoy it. I don't have anything massive left, left on my golf bucket list. Well, I think, you know, from, from someone who's in your line of work, Jeff, uh, you know, you always got to have one eye on if you're exploring new venues and new destinations and things like that, you're going to be a little bit more apprehensive about that than you would be in all your tried and tested trips to Ireland and Scotland and, uh, and elsewhere. But um, I've got to say that, you know, the, the, the groups we have had, perhaps not so much from the U S but from Sweden and Germany and France um, and perhaps other countries a little bit, um, you know, more in Europe, um, the amount of repeat, requests we get for people to come to to certainly come and play golf uh, and Cornwall um, is a good testament to uh, you know to allay your fears I guess in terms of people will come here and have a great time there's Padstow just over the over the water the other side where your photo in the background there Padstow's on that side of the estuary um, lots of uh, Michelin starred restaurants uh, really really good hospitality very culturally different i guess to what people are used to in um in the us by and large um in terms of the the things that you experience cornish pasties being one of them yeah, you get, get your hands on a pasty in, in the us maybe not very often but yeah. they are delicious that's my understanding yeah i've got one more question for you and that is for people coming over for the first time to play Lynx golf in England and uh, hopefully at St. Enoduck, what advice do you have for someone coming over for the first time? Uh, depending on when you're coming um, and what, and which part of the, the, the state you're coming from, um, I would always um, prepare for the weather. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we have, a, I guess, a... Um, you have a, already have a preconceived idea in the US of what the, the US weather's like. Um, that's a long-standing joke, isn't it, um, when people come and visit. That said, the last three summers that we've had out of four have been absolutely fantastic, yeah. uh, to the point of this year we were only a couple of weeks away from running out of water for the golf course. Um, so I, I would say pack, pack just in case. Uh, you know, jumpers and a, and a few warmer clothes. Yeah. Um, you probably won't need them, but 
you're always exposed to the elements when you're playing Lynx golf. You know, you have no trees, no no cover really to protect you from anything. And if you see some weather on the horizon behind you, um, you know you're going to get wet. Uh, uh, if it's coming, it's coming. And it, and it can change very, very quickly here. Um, but if you're coming in high summer, um, the, 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 the part in shot I can give you really is uh, don't come armed with your your US game yeah. because you'll end up having a, a, a cricket score. Um, you've got to be able to try and find some time for a little bit of practice, a little bit of bumping, running seven irons and rescue clubs or prepare to having half swings with putters and stuff like that over hills and mounds and slopes and hitting shots like that, like that, like that. Um, I don't think you probably do that too often in the courses you play, uh, by and large. Yeah. Um, so a bit like training to go skiing. You know, there's lots of uh, exercise you can do for your knees and your lower legs before you strap your skis on. Otherwise, you, you go skiing and then you can't go skiing for another three days afterwards. Right. Um, the, the more tips in and around the greens, I would say that makes or breaks your holiday or your tour if you're coming yeah. Uh, get used to playing those shots very quickly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's wonderful advice. And as you said earlier, it's almost like it's a different game or a different sport, right, when you're playing Lynx golf, and, um, which is what I think uh, makes it so special. And I think what's made me a better golfer is playing golf over there and having to use your imagination about – you know, how am I going to get this close to the hole? And you think I could use a three wood. We use three woods around here, around the green. To yeah. get to, like when you're getting through some. The fringe. Yeah. But you could use that or a seven iron or a putter or, you know, the last thing you want to do in most instances is to try and flop it up there. Off of I would say that was, that's right at the bottom of your list. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. No, unless, I mean, we church course isn't. In comparison to some courses, it isn't overly bunkered. I think there are about 28 bunkers on the golf course, but all 28 of them are absolute shockers. They are pot bunkers. They are yeah. they are gathered in like that, and they have big revetted faces like you would, you know, like the road holes in Andrews. Not quite so bad as that, but not far off most of the holes that, that bunkers are on. Um, so plenty of practice for opening the face as high as much as you can and praying. With your eyes shut. Yeah. <laughs> with your eyes shut. And swing with your eyes open, I hope. Yeah. Anyway. Well, Simon, this has been uh, a real treat to have you today. We're, we're really, literally thrilled that you could join us. I think, if memory serves, you're the first person from England, or certainly from an English golf club that we've had on the podcast. Oh, well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. That's, uh, I didn't know that, but, um, but, but it's been a pleasure talking to you. And then... Um, uh, you know, I hope I hope you can uh, convince some people to uh, once they've seen this um, to where do I sign up? Exactly, yeah. that's the goal is to get more people into to your part of the world and certainly specifically to Saint Enoduck. So thank you very much for your time. It was a real pleasure. Nice to meet you, Jeff. Be well. <laughs>